Hi everyone, for this week's presentation, our team will be introducing GraphSage, a graph representation model presented in the 2017 NeurIVS conference by the Computer Science Department of Stanford University. Although it's relative age, GraphSage still achieve impressive results on numerous graph-related problems, so we hope you'll enjoy this. Before diving into the content, here is the general outline of this presentation. We'll first start by a general introduction, followed by the methodology used by the authors, then we'll have a look at the benchmark presented in the original paper. A brief discussion over the strengths and weaknesses of the model to some current application of GraphSage will be presented at the end. So, graph structure data are omnipresent in most real-life domains. A quick reminder, a graph a graph, sorry, is simply a structure representing a set of entities in which some pair have some kind of relationship to each other. In last week's class, we've seen some examples of graphs like social network, intermolecular interaction, but there's also maps, infrastructure, computer network, the list goes on. With the help of those representations, we can perform a lot of interesting prop optimization problems, such as finding the shortest uh, pass be between point A to point B, optimize flight schedule, cluster a group of people in a social network, etc., etc. So the field of graph is of importance for, a numer for numerous uh, real-life applications, but the order of complexity quickly grows exponentially and networks become hard to manage or analyze. So how can the field of deep learning help solve those graph-related challenges? As previously mentioned in our course, the aim of graph neural network is to learn meaningful graph representation. In other words, learn a more compact representation while still preserving important visible features, but also latent structural information of the network. Of the network. And this isn't as straightforward as it may seem. With the deep learning um, paradigm, new challenges arise. First, due to its size and arbitrary choice of structure, the data isn't regular, nor dense in most cases. Also, compared to images or text, graph data lack semantic meaning. This complex topology leads to neural network having a really hard time to converge to an optimal solution. In order to solve this problem, the goal of graph representation learning will be to construct a set of embeddings representing the structure of the graph and the data thereon. We can distinguish three types of embedding. Firstly, node-wise embeddings representing each node of the graph, then edge-wise embeddings representing each edge in the graph, and finally, graph-wise embeddings representing the graph as a whole. To give Graph Sage a little more context, let's revisit some previous work in the field. Different approaches can be applied in order to learn graph-related embeddings. For example, Deep Walk will do so by randomly generating short walks, transforming neighborhood information into a continuous vector space using skipgram, skipgram techniques. Or line, on the other hand, leverage local and global information by modeling first and second order proximity to learn its embedding. It will then try to minimize the difference between the input and the embedding distribution. Another method tries to apply convolution operation on graph data. It learns a node representation at each hidden layer and flattens those representations with a softmax to classify every node in the graph. Authors of the paper were particularly interested in extending the graph convolutional network and tried to, uh, to generalize the idea to an inductive framework. But although previous approaches have seen a lot of success in their domain, they're all inherently transductive in their original setup, and trying to transform them into an inductive framework is computationally expensive. This is due to the fact that most graph representation learning models are based on matrix factorization methods, meaning they generally need to access the full Laplacian matrix in order to make prediction on unseen data. In simpler terms, 
transductive methods are in general. If there is a change in the graph, the model will need to relearn its embedding from scratch. Induction, on the other hand, tries to learn general rules that can be applied to unseen cases. But applying an inductive approach on graph is tricky because generalizing to unseen nodes requires aligning new observed data in the graph. This is hard because the model must learn to recognize structural properties in order to infer not only the role of the node locally, but also globally. You may ask why is induction important in the first place? This is because uh, in most real world application, networks are dynamic, not static, meaning they're fast changing. New nodes are cons constantly added or removed. Feature of a node are also bound to change. All this make transductive approaches impractical for dynamic graph, knowing the time and, co and cost of training large scale real world graph. GraphSage will try to address this transductive, transductive issue. I'll let Vincent explain how it's done. Okay, so I'm going to explain to you guys the methodology behind GraphSage. But before I do this, I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So just, just to reiterate, GraphSage is an algorithm that computes node embeddings for a given graph. Um, okay, so now that this is out of the way, I'm going to start by explaining the, the name. Um, so the authors chose Graph Sage because uh, Sage is actually an acronym for the two most important concepts in this algorithm, which are the sampling and the aggregation. So if you look in this slide on the right hand side, you can uh, see kind of a sneak peek of what the algorithm does. And uh, we're going to use this image later on to explain other things. But for now, you can see that if we would want to predict the embedding for node A, we would uh, first sample its neighboring nodes, which would be, uh, in this case, nodes B, C, and D. We would aggregate their uh, feature representations, uh, which would be the H0Bs. Uh, and then um, the aggregation would be in the gray square. And then we would use this the output of this aggregation to update the node embedding. So now that I've presented kind of the general uh, framework behind the algorithm, we're going to go into more details. So this is what um, the pseudocode for the uh, forward pass of the algorithm looks like. Uh, it looks very complicated, but uh, we're going to go into uh, specific details at every step to make sure that you guys understand what's going on. So we've created a simple example. Um, and then in this example, we want to predict the node embedding for the node D in this graph. So the first step in the algorithm is first to uh, compute the initial in initialized um, or sorry the initial node representation for every nodes in this graph and to do so we simply use the feature of uh, every node so the the features are basically um, the same as features in other uh, other data science um, applications uh, but in this case they might uh, include features that are more related to, to uh, graphs, such as the degree of nodes. So now that uh, once that we have all the initialized representations, we can go into the further steps. So for the step two, we uh, first start the uh, main loop, which is an iteration over different search depths uh, for all uh, search depths given. So a search depth is basically um, the number that that's, um, stands for the sampling of the neighborhood. So 
uh, if we have a search depth of one, we're going to sample nodes uh, that are all in the in a, a distance of one of our given node. Um, yeah. And then uh, we're going to enter the inner loop, which is a loop over all of the nodes in the graph. So in our case, since we are only uh, focused on node D, uh, we're only going to take into consideration uh, what happens for node D. But in practice, we would um, do this for all of the nodes in the graph. OK, so for the, for the next step, uh, this is where the sampling happens. And so since we're at a search depth of one, we only sample um, nodes that are in the first distance of node D. So um, in Graph Sage, we set a fixed size for the uh, set of uh, sampled nodes for every search depth. And in our example, this size would be three because we see that uh, the algorithm uh, in the picture to the left of the slide, uh, chose to, to use as sampled as sample the nodes A, E, and G, uh, which are uh, highlighted in green. So um, once that we have this sampling, uh, we're ready to aggregate them. And then to do so um, in the algorithm, we can use many different aggregation functions. Uh, one of them is simply the mean, uh, and this is what we chose to present for this simple example. So um, the H1 of ND, uh, which you can see at the bottom of the slide, uh, would sim simply be a, a, an average of uh, all the features of the nodes A, E, and G. So once, once that we have this, uh, we need to concatenate it with our current node representation. And then once we have the concatenation, we pass this inside a fully connected uh, layer to get uh, the node representation at a search depth of one. And then once this would be done for all of the nodes in our graph, uh, we would normalize all of the representations. And these would kind of act as the node embeddings for the search depth of one. But this process would be repeated for all of our different search, search depths. Um, and then we would simply use the last um, representation of the last search uh, depth as our node embedding. So this is how we obtain the node embedding for the node D with the graph sage approach. So now that we know how the forward pass works, we can talk about how the model learns its par parameters and um, the par parameters that will have to be learned will of course be the fully connected layers, the parameters or the weights for all of the fully connected layers uh, for every search depth. And dep depending on the aggregation function, there might also be parameters to be learned uh, in these aggregation functions. Uh, so like I said, we're going to talk more about the aggregation functions in a little bit. Uh, but for now, we're just explaining the uh, how to learn um, the parameters. So the way we learn parameters is just the same basically as uh, most deep learning uh, problems. So we basically compute um, an output and then this output is compared with the ground truth in a supervised manner uh, when, we when we're in a supervised scenario, sorry, uh, to compute a loss. And then this loss is then uh, used to backpropagate and to optimize the uh, parameters. And uh, in this case, uh, I believe that it was a stochastic gradient descent that, way, that was used to optimize the parameters. So for Graph Sage, we actually have uh, two ways to um, learn the parameters. So we can learn them in a unsupervised way. And um, when we 
want to use the node embeddings for a specific task uh, that we know in advanced. That could be, for example, a, a node classification. Uh, we could use a um, supervised a loss function, such as the cross entropy uh, loss function. So, um, in the unsupervised uh, way, um, you can see the function here in the middle of the slide. Um, it looks very complicated, but the intuition behind this function is actually the same as a word embedding. So um, the loss function basically uh, tries to push away all the nodes that are far to each other in a graph and then regroup all of the uh, node embeddings that are uh, of nodes that are uh, close to each other in a graph. Um, and then it will penalize cases where um, these assumptions are not respected. So this is basically it for the methodology, but we're, we're just going to present the aggregating functions uh, next. The aggregation step of the graph stage algorithm is the most important one, because it is during this step that graph stage is capable of learning structural information about the node's role in a graph. In fact, graph stage owes its inductive capacities to this aggregation step. We already presented all the algorithm works, but the original paper proposes three different ways of aggregating the embeddings of a set of neighbors into the embedding of a neighborhood, which are a mean aggregator, a pruning aggregator, and an LSTM aggregator, which we are going to quickly present. The mean aggregator is as simple as it sounds. Uh, given a particular node in a graph, the mean aggregator will simply take the element-wise mean of the neighboring nodes, vectors, and form the embedding of this node's neighbor. The pruning aggregator implies that we take the embeddings of the node's neighbors and feed them through a fully connected neural net with a max pool output. But it is important to note that while this could be a complex network, in the original paper, simple single-layer architectures are preferred. Finally, and following the same ID, the embeddings of a neighborhood can be formed by passing the nodes into an LSTM model that will try to learn how to properly aggregate the neighbors. One issue with this approach is that the LSTM model will try to give a meaning to the order in which the neighbors are passed, which isn't something we want, as this isn't information that is originally present in graph. To overcome this, the model would have to be trained over different orderings or permutations of the neighbors. In order to assess the performance of graph stage, the model was tested on three different benchmarks. The goal of the first one is to classify academic papers into different subjects. This is achieved by using citation from the Web of Science database, which are coming from six biology related fields. This leads to a graph that displays over 300k nodes, which have all an average degree of 9.15. The second benchmark is based on the website Reddits, and the goal here would be to classify the community of the Reddits a given Reddit post per minister. Those posts are taken from 50 different community slash subreddits, which leads to a graph that has over 230k nodes, and each node has an average degree of 492. Last but not least, uh, the graph stage uh, algorithm will be tested on protein protein interaction. The goal here is to classify protein functions across various biological protein protein interaction graphs. While the first two experiments were pretty similar, uh, they were still offering a different architecture. This experiment is really there to test the inductive capacities of graph stage. The model will be trained and tested on a multitude of protein-protein interaction graphs, and it will have to classify protein functions based on graphs it doesn't train on. To offer a baseline on which graph stage will be compared, the F1 score for a few contenders and for each dataset are also computed. The first one is simply a random classifier. The one called raw features is a logistic regression that ignores the graph structure of the datasets. Then we have the deep work algorithm that we are already familiar with. And the last one is a concatenation of the deep work embeddings and the logistic regression. You can already see that deep work isn't able to achieve the protein protein interaction task because of the embedding issue that we've covered at the beginning of the presentation. A few variants of graph stage are also tested. You might recognize three of them that are the three different aggregators that one can choose when using graph stage. The fourth one is something you haven't covered yet and is called graph stage GTN which is an extension of graph convolutional networks, which uses the way graph stage uh, does its sampling of neighbors in a graph. It isn't extensively covered in a paper, but it was still presented in the results. As you can see, uh, graph stage outperforms the simpler classifiers every time, 
and is able to perform the protein protein interaction task while conserving graph structures and landy walk. Another thing we can point out is that the different aggregators offer a different performance across the data sets. An intuition we can have behind this is that, for example, on grid data sets, while giving very marginal improvements in a supervised setting, the LSTM aggregator was probably able to have a better understanding of the contextual information in a graph. And given the fact that this graph had a very high average node degree of 492, the LSTM aggregator probably made more sense in this situation. Uh, lastly, we see that the performance of unsupervised graph stage is reasonably competitive with the fully supervised version, uh, indicating that the framework can achieve strong performance without task specific fine tuning. While graph stage seems to have a very good performance on those three different tasks it was tested on, this isn't its only strength. Since graph stage doesn't need to completely embed unseen nodes, it is much faster when performing inference compared to an algorithm like the work. The results you are seeing on your screen are based on Revit datasets, and while training time is a bit slower, especially for the LSTM aggregator, it is 100 times faster when performing inference on the full test set. Generally, the paper specifies that deep work can be 100 times to 500 times slower than GraphSage when performing inference. GraphSage presents some very interesting results, but still displays some mess. Some are presented directly in the paper, some are not. In order to sample the neighbors of a node without interesting bias, you still need to iterate through all of them. This means all the graph stage does restrict the size of the input to the neural network. The step required to populate the input involves looking through the entire graphs, which can be costly. Considering the neighbors of a node for k equals 2 provided a consistent boost in accuracy of around 10 to 15% on average, compared to only considering adjacent neighbors. However, increasing k beyond 2 gave marginal returns in performance while increasing the runtime by a large factor of 10 to 200. Even with a fixed neighborhood size, applying this scheme recursively means that you get an exponential explosion of the neighborhood size. For example, if we take only 10 random neighbors for each time and decide to use k equals 3, this means that we need to apply the aggregation of our three recursive steps. This requires taking 10 neighbors of the target node, then 10 neighbors for each of those neighbors, and then again 10 neighbors for each of the neighbors of neighbors, resulting in a neighborhood size of 10 Q. Another limit to the scalability of graph stage is that distributed computing is difficult for graph-based methods. Naively distributing graph data across uh, different machines introduces a significant problem when using graph stage as there is no guarantee that good neighborhood aggregation can be done without communicating across the network. To quickly conclude, GraphSage is an inductive representation learning algorithm that is especially useful for graphs that grow over time. It is much faster to create embeddings for new nodes with GraphSage compared to transactive techniques. Additionally, GraphSage does not compromise performance for speed. It was tested on three different data sets that entail node classification, node clustering, and a cross graph generalization, and outperformed the existing solutions. Still, GraphSage finally justified the use of graph neural networks for real-world applications, thanks to its scalability. For example, Avais now uses GraphSage with a few modifications to improve their recommendation system. To do so, they create two bipartite graphs, one that represents users and dishes as nodes, with edges representing the number of times a user ordered a specific dish, and a second graph which represents users and restaurants as nodes, and edges representing how many times a user order from a specific restaurant. The way GraphSage does its sampling on neighbors and the constraints, the number of nodes sampled at one and two hot distance from the node of which we want to obtain the representation, makes a lot of sense in this situation and makes it possible to scale learning to graphs with billions of nodes and providing even better suggestion. Finally, the inference speed that GraphSage offers allows it to be applied to situations that really benefits of being represented as graphs but were too constrained um, by the necessity of getting short-term predictions on ever-evolving graphs, like the forecasting of traffic conditions. Thank you for your attention. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any question on GraphSage.